Well, hi everyone. A uh, very exciting lecture we have uh, this afternoon. Uh, this is going to be streaming live on YouTube. So, for those who don't know me, my name is Evan Douglas, and I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce this afternoon's, afternoon's speakers, Shana Onan and Ashok Sukumaran, uh, the founders and principal directors of the internationally renowned transdisciplinary media practice camp. Structured as a, a collective of artists, filmmakers, software programmers, architects, activists, and archivists, camp produces highly provocative and timely public art projects. Um, films, electronic media on a global scale concerned with the history and politics of technology and experimental uh, video and audio. This also includes their curatorial oversight of their celebrated online video archives, PADMA, which stands for Public Access Distributed Media Archives. Their community cultural space, r, &R located in the suburb of Mankert, and their well-known community rooftop cinema, Camp Rooftop. Projects have ranged over the years from a forensic study of the complex socio-cultural and political history of housing in Mumbai, India, a public interrogation of the massive surveillance apparatus deployed throughout the streets of Manchester, England, reminiscent of George Orwell's dystopian social science fiction novel, 1984 an anthropological inquiry into our vast international road systems and the extensive network of forces that underlie its resurgence and demise. Two, a poignant examination of the use of technology as an elusive system of oppression as experienced firsthand through the testimonials of eight Palestinian families living in East, Jer East Jerusalem in the Middle East. Envision in more fluid terms, CAMP advocates for an ever expanding open source discourse and community-based initiatives committed to overcoming the traditional binary interpretation of the world around us, i.e. art versus non-art, commodity markets versus free culture, the individual versus the institution, in favor of a more distributed and inclusive model where power, pleasure, freedom, creativity, social and environmental justice and capital are all made more accessible as an equitable construct for a global community. Camp's work has appeared at venues throughout the world, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Documenta 13, Tate Modern, Guangzhou, Tape, Shanghai, Sharjah, and Kochi, Missouri biennials. Given the vast technological infrastructures attributed to multinational corporations and state bodies everywhere that continue to perpetuate oppressive forms of control worldwide, Camp's brilliant activist agenda represents a new and welcome model of social engagement within the public domain. As characterized in their own words, Camp seeks to establish, in quotes, a new form of radical hospitality that could allow us to escape the current discourses of property, security, and paranoia. Please welcome Shana Onan and Ashok Sukumaran tonight to RPI. Wow, thank you. That was a very extensive and generous introduction. <clears throat> Thank you. My pleasure. We are uh, delighted to be here. And uh, even though it's uh, late here, it's not too late. Uh, we find evenings in Mumbai, Bombay. Uh, we use both names as we can explain later. Uh, to be invigorating times um, and times to to get together with friends, which, which as we haven't been doing in the regular way in the last couple of years, we are able to, to expand in a way globally. And it's a great delight to be able to visit 
uh, some of you remotely for this session. Uh, now, if you will allow us to, I'm Ashok, this is China, we'll take turns uh, talking through a few things. And we have a title, we have a, we have a, a path through this talk tonight that we hope will, will provoke um, some thinking, uh, and especially for people training to be architects. Um, so, but first, let's take you back to um, a street in Bombay in 2000. Five uh, and a very early interventionist, uh, privilege escalationist, uh, public art work, let's call it. So <clears throat> you can see our messy desktop, and now you can see. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, these are two interesting and relatively loaded words, and we'll get into it um, in a second. Uh, we are trying to make sure we see ourselves. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. All set. That's the official title. This is our <clears throat> more warmer hello to all of you. And here's 2005 um, Bombay Street. Let us know if you can see and hear. Yes, we can see and hear. Okay. Everything's working. Hmm. We have someone walking around in downtown Mumbai, uh, actually a municipal worker, turning the street lights off. And when the street lights go off, there is this strange other, let's call it an image for today, that is strolling across uh, the buildings that constitute this very public, very important historical square in downtown Mumbai. In the center of this are some people uh, who are hand cranking this uh, panoramic image that is flying across the sky and for those purposes their, their sort of amazement at power at a distance, at, uh, being able to control something much, much larger than themselves public, private, uh, and the old things and things that were made last week, like uh, the like homes, closed homes, process streets, with all kinds of unallowed behavior um, in a shape that is reminiscent of many celebrations that happen in the city. In fact, the lights that are being turned on in the landscape are often always already present uh, in the walls and in the households and in the living rooms, but here they are brought into a, a kind of strange and beautiful uh, conversation with each other. That means light in people's living rooms are now horizontally connected to lights on the one of the oldest buildings in the city. I'll let you watch this for another. Street lights are off, and this uh, movie, which tells in a way the history of the city, um, plays across the landscape. So, um, the hand crank is quite directly a reference to photo cinema and three cinematic devices. So, that's half the. Where you circuit. had these moving panoramas that you put there. Travel through, right? You were through, and you could be in a gondola and the landscape of Venice. There's a very uh, direct cinematic reference. 
well as a dig at global. <laughs> okay. So, um, that was two very early artwork uh, with Naughty because we, as we want to talk about today, um, escalated our privileges, which were originally meant to do a light artwork for this oldest, uh, one of the older buildings in the city. Uh, this is 150 year, year anniversary of the General Post Office, which is that uh, the building, uh, the, the decorative building uh, you see in front, but we extended that privilege, right, into uh, the whole landscape around it. And these are both metaphors, but also sort of actual things that we like to realize, right? We, we believe that art is not only dealing in, in the metaphoric, in the sort of icono iconographic, but has to demonstrate some actual capacity to enter worlds and environments and change them in whichever way it, it can. So here's a, like, uh, it might be a bit early, but here's a diagram just trying to explain uh, one set of our sort of ethos as, as camp, which is a group of um, now five people who work not so far away in a, in a, in say, in a day to day world from an architectural studio, but doing very different things, right? Um, so here are some principles we go by. Privilege escalation is on top, and I'll just describe what that means more precisely in a second. It's the other side of being a parasite, right? Of being a parasite who wants to be parasited in turn, who is hungry uh, for things, but hungry not to feed their own self, but also to escalate it this, uh, again, not for oneself, but for, for others as well, right? To extend the range of our organs um, is in the in the horizontal direction. Sensory extension, which you see very much, which is sort of McLuhan-esque idea, but is very much there in, in this, small example that you just saw. And, uh, and the thing that it accompanies, that means sacrifice being, you have to choose your battles, right, in a way. Uh, contemporary art was well known for, for expanding endlessly, uh, dissipating uh, beyond all possible boundaries. And in a way, we've realized that this isn't possible, right? We all have uh, limits and we make sacrifices in order to, uh, to, to support more powerful sensorial ex extensions or more interesting escalations. And we'll come back to that in a second. But today we wanted to share a journey that begins with space. Uh, you're all going to be or are already architects in your minds. And we wanted to share a special idea of what um, some of these things we do uh, would mean. Uh, what, they, what, they, what they do in space, right? And, and what the sort of formulas by which we put together some of our projects. Uh, but first, uh, 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 as promised, a definition of the term privilege escalation. Right? This is from Wikipedia, which is uh, good enough for now. Privilege escalation is the act of exploiting a bug, a design flaw, or a configuration oversight in an operating system or software application to gain elevated access to resources that are normally protected from one from another application or from a certain user right so it's a kind of a hacker strategy right uh, the most common examples being in corporate organizations where an outsider gets access to an employee's part of the network and then tries to use that use that to gain access to the administrative part of that network, right now we are using this in a very specific uh, sense as a cultural mode, right, where we access parts of the world that are increasingly inaccessible to normal human beings. Um, and through kind of cultural uh, powers, right, including the class in the Marxist sense status of the ind individuals, uh, including us, who can access certain things, who must in turn enable greater and deeper access for everyone, right? This broadly speaking uh, is the role of culture and art as we see it. It's a problem of deep forms of access in some ways. Um, and more holistically, uh, it becomes one part of the so-called structural diagram that we just showed you, um, which includes uh, the extension of our senses, uh, parasiting, capital, and other forces, and sacrifice. 
right? Among other, that's one constellation. Uh, today we are going to use a subset of our work, specifically, uh, mainly, uh, our work with CCTV systems uh, around the world in some ways, as a way to describe uh, this sort of positioning, right? Um, it's, you're familiar probably with uh, Foucault's panopticon, right? The model of the prison where the guard is in the middle, the rooms are around them, and they can see everything, um, uh, which uh, has been reinterpreted in a non spatial way by Deleuze and Guattari, for example, calling it the society of control, right? But for us, it's quite important to not say that control is everywhere, the state is everywhere, military is everywhere, surveillance. Is it's very important to be specific, to map out, to enter these environments, to intervene in them, to look at them from inside. Um, so let us look at some examples of what this could mean. And we'll start in faraway England, now, who were our colonial masters, and then bring you back to where we live and work, which is in Bombay on the western shore of um, India. And maybe China will... Yeah, so we were in 2005, that's 16 years ago in Bombay, and now we're going to go to the UK in 2006. So you have to understand that this is when Ashok and me are both um, uh, uh, emerging, walking on the streets, testing our practice and uh, challenging all received notions of rights, of what a documentary image can be, of what architecture should be and what on earth is contemporary art today, right? So we have this um, energy. Uh, we're not middle-aged and gray-haired as you see us now. Um, and the reason we wanted to take you back to these projects is uh, to give you a historic and material sense also of how camp, uh, and these are all pre-camp, Ashok's globe positioning system. And the next project we will talk about is before camp, uh, could even develop its concepts and sets of ideas to say, hey, we want to exist exist in the contemporary art and architecture scene uh, in a certain way, right? So these are these are proto camp works that bring give us our uh, fulcrum, our ethos and way of being and doing, right? So 15 years ago, after thinking hard about the documentary image, Ashok came from architecture, I came uh, from film. I had arrived at a few truths. One way to read an image was to examine its kernel, the arrangement at the origin, like before the image is, is generated, this arrangement between the subject, author, and technology. Um, which way did this power and agency flow? And the truth lay in the terms of that engagement, right? That kernel of truth was right there. And my restless post-colonial angsty self at that point acknowledged very early on in my own image making and image taking practice that it didn't quite matter. And I'm saying this now when all of you are in the throes of identity politics, right? So I realized quite early on that it didn't quite matter if that offensive image was generated by a white male, a brown female, a queer person, or a person from the same ethnic, ethnic community as the subjects, or a not so common mix of all of the above. It didn't matter if the form of address and the framing was the same, right? So it was, it was pointless for me to say, ah, white guy did it, or privileged brown girl did it, because the arrangement, the scopic and spatial arrangement of these flows of, of the uh, dynamics between subject, author, and technology had stayed unchallenged, right? So look at what's going on in a very material sense uh, in, 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 in the dynamics and the interplay between this. And an early, early, early filmmaking practice of mine said we have to devolve. We have to devolve the role of that technology. We have to devolve the role of the author and somehow move, move the agenda, move the agency towards the subject, right? So that was one sort of utopic way of, of seeing things. But then all this flips around quite suddenly, right? Now I want to go to the UK and I need two iris scanned and 10 fingers reprinted 
and this is the 12th time I'm doing it. I thought they don't change from like five years of my life age to when I die. But in order to enter the United Kingdom, one is repeatedly doing this kind of biometrics. And naturally, of course, the joke will be you're entering nanny state and big brother state. And it is true, you do feel like this brown set walking in the streets constantly being watched at. Now I could, I'm invited to a museum and it's an open-ended commission. Our curator says, what do you want to do? I could have easily walked those streets and mapped these cameras as this powerless brown individual under a queen's, former queen subject under this gaze. But no, hey, I have privileges. I have, despite those damn iris scans and that stupid visa process, I'm here and someone's asked me what I'd like to do. So we're in the city of Manchester, as even explained earlier in our introduction, and we ask to access the open street surveillance of the city. And we ask to access it by being able to enter the black box, right? Technologies are sandboxed, your camera is sandboxed, your phone is black boxed in a certain way. Well, we want to enter this control room and we want to see the second life. It was a game that was very uh, the immersive game of that time in 2006. We want to see the second life city uh, from inside. And once we had access to the CCTV control rooms, and why did we have access? Privilege, contemporary art project, artist commission, we in turn decided to open it up to members of the public. And this is a key part of privilege escalation. The ethical hacker will go there, but once she has access, it behooves her and she needs to send it out, right? Out into the world in a certain way. Um, so here we are. Um, in 2006, inside um, the control room of uh, um, a police control room in Manchester City. Key locals, see a lot of artists, architects, and filmmakers. Swing camera 17 on to your left, or camera 13 towards the gates at All Saints Park. I see a guy and a girl pushing a pushing a trolley, having a blaze, blazing round with each other opposite the church. Okay, just make sure she's alright. Just um, check. I'll just keep an eye from a distance now, just to, uh, so I'm not in their personal space, but obviously something's going on, we don't know yeah, if it's yeah. going to get aggressive towards the girl. Let's see it loud and clear. I'll pull out a little more because of... Yeah, Roger. They've actually kind of split up now and she's walking towards what used to be the Metro All Saints Park and he's on route towards camera 17, over. Security. So 40 people entered the control room. Sorry. Obviously a bit of a domestic. Do you know where it is? They spent an hour each that, questioning the audience, looking at their yeah, because we do, we deal with some really nasty stuff sometimes. Like we're watching someone here, uh, knowing for what they're running up there, and I'll have, if they got the back to me, I'll, have, I'll swing this one round and have it ready. Mm -hmm. And then if they turn that way, I'll have that one swinging round ready. No, no. Just to keep the continu con continuity of it. And do you, um, do you film stuff um, yourself? Like, I don't know, holiday videos or anything like that that you would edit? Yeah. No. Yeah. Are you in, in front of cameras. <laughs> so you're not you're not interested in kind of filmmaking or uh, not to that extent. So can people request their images off you like? If somebody's walking through the campus say and they see a camera following they are quite within their rights under the Data Protection Act to request to see any footage that they think may have been taken of them. But in saying that, they're allowed to see that footage, but any other persons on that footage are gonna be blurred out. 
So it's a bit of a. Are you with me? It's a, it a lot. Of, it's a quite a complicated yeah. process, and I've, in the ten years I've been here, I've never known anyone to ask it. Um, so here's the work as it travels. Um, it's important for us to um, once we we modify a landscape, right? This default landscape of a CCTV control room uh, was. Uh, Breached, right? People came in and the emotional state of the workers and the work city you saw underneath. Um, everyone asked in the end, I got mugged under camera 29. Where were you when that happened, right? So it's important for us once this is generated that these images circulate, right? Both in the art world and, and, and elsewhere. We'll come to the elsewhere later. But here's um, CCTV social cold clinic as in the Foucauldian Clinic. That was what the work was called back then, uh, uh, installed inside a prison in Nottingham, in the city of Nottingham. Um, Steve told us no one had accessed CCTV footage, even though under the Data Protection Act, Steve is the guard we just heard. Um, I've never known anybody to ask of it, but you're well within your rights to ask for it. So here's CCTV footage. This is actually helicopter footage um, from Manchester uh, in 1996. Um, uh, an IRA bomb uh, went off inside the Arndale Mall. And the Arndale Mall was this old mall in the city centre. Uh, the IRA had called uh, the mayor to inform them about the bombing. Everybody was evacuated and only the building blew up. And the next day, the papers in Manchester said, uh, every cloud has a silver lining, saved by the bomb, was uh, another headline. And um, the city of Manchester um, used the bombing of this old decorative mall in the city center, which at that point they called Gunchester. But historically, it was the city center of the Cotton Exchange um, and the Cheatham Library in Marks in England. And a lot of time together, initially working class in England was in there, and of course, the manifesto was in the center. Um, so, when the new mall was built, it was it, this bombing figured out a massive regeneration campaign. The word regeneration and all of that which we have studied about how it transformed uh, smaller cities of, 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 of the UK emerged at that in that late 90s moment in Manchester City. They were waiting for the Commonwealth Games, they used this bombing as a, as a silver lining uh, in quotes to uh, build on the site of the old mall, the largest mall in Europe. That probably still the largest in city mall, not the street malls outside. Um, so here we are, and the footprint of the uh, small decorative mall grew step over the city, over Cheatham Library's exit, over Exchange Square, and so Halley Square is not the mall square that you see in the CCTV metadata down there, but it, it was a historic city square and the mall is sitting on it. Um, what you see happening here is uh, members of the public are either well aware they're under 206 cameras inside this mall or they be, they're having conversations with someone who is informing them about the fact that A, there are 206 uh, cameras in this mall and B, you're well within your rights, as we learned from Steve, under the Data Protection Act, to access your image. And would you like to today? So it's sort of an extended public art project where myself, some of the people we met in the control room of the earlier project, uh, and some colleagues from, from the museum I was working at, um, are walking around with this document, which is an image release form. Here we are in the control room where uh, the operators are tracking us and everyone they see signing this form, right? The 
over the course of the day, over 150 people signed the meeting. That concatenated the vision of the Data Protection Act, that we mentioned, and the standard document release form, right? If you filmed me incidentally in this project, now it is fine. This is very particular in the it can happen to be incidental in, 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 in some documents you put it in an AV assistant director that they want your consent. It's called image release, right? So here, this public art prank in one sense is being played on the mall's authorities. Um, at the end of the day, we handed over 150 documents. Meanwhile, they'd already followed the people who consented to be followed, right? Once they signed, we told them. Camera is going to track them for a bit. We need their apologies to you. It's part of this larger project. There we all are in a huddle, counting the forms at the end of the second day. Um, I'm reminded of those pigeons because Michael Clear, a German filmmaker who made the first CTV uh, film ever in 1984, no less, um, said under CCTV, even a pigeon looks like a murder suspect. So here's the form. And uh, what a suspect. Uh, here's the form, and um, um, yeah, the prank worked. The mall handed us all the footage, uh, which was, of course, put back in the public domain, returned to everyone who gave us their emails and contact numbers. And uh, this film, Capital Circus, was, was made from it. Um, so yeah, these guys were DJing with their joysticks and punching in like number 197 and one number 206, you know, so that the keyboard uh, uh, punch in those numbers and gain control of the camera. But I was curious and bought one of them um, of Edgware Road in London uh, for, I remember it was 340 pounds then. Um, we were invited to, to the Palestinian city of Jerusalem by a Palestinian art organization um, and a German curator the following year from the CCTV experiments to, to do something again, open-ended commission. That's the freedom and privilege that we're also talking about here, right? It comes with sacrifices. It comes with uh, sensory extension. You do something, the landscape gets changed. It's felt in a certain way. Um, you redistribute it, right? That's the early diagram we have. And in turn, you should get parasites and other people should use it, right? So this is, uh, you could say, one kind of kernel or coda of our practice. So here we are, um, that one camera bought on Edgeware Road makes it into uh, uh, Jerusalem city via the Israeli uh, uh, authorities at Tel Aviv uh, airport. Um, The, the camera and joystick was really easy to get in, but while getting out, I was rated enemy of state, um, et cetera, right? But right now it looked like DJ equipment, it came in. So here it is housed in a box and placed um, at certain locations uh, um, across the city of Jerusalem, right? This is now uh, um, the Wailing Wall and the Western Wall courtyard, but the Al-Aqsa Masjid, in the back. Um, Palestinian families are viewing this footage from the safety of their homes live. Uh, live on their TV sets. It's just terrestrial. The AV cable is going into their TV sets. They've got the joystick in their hand and they're speaking live over the images um, in what Masao Adachi had tried to articulate in his very short lived landscape theory, right? It's a Japanese word for Kiron. But since you want to understand power, you've got to read your landscape in a certain way. So here oh, are the scene. Uh, 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 really uh, enjoying the joystick. Um, uh, Camera is mounted as you took in their homes. So a pretty one for a tripod. But here it's our own. And it's also uh, been put in place um, quite autonomous, right? There's no mark from the Israeli authorities. Um, 
There's only consent from the families we're working with. هذه الآثار أصلا هان كان بيت مختار حركة المغاربة وفي البداية رفضوا إخلاء المكان لكن اضطروا إنه يخلو وفي البداية عملوا مركز بوليس بعدين جديد هذا الحكي إله تقريبا سنة عم بيعملوا حفريات اكتشفوا آثار رومانية يعني هم عم بيحاولوا انه يكتشفوا اثار تابعه للاسرائيليين لغايه الان ما في طيب بنشوف هون جنب الدار شيء زي كانها مدرسه هاي المدرسة الدينية هذه كانت أملاك ل للخالدي وصدرت الأسباب الأمنية سنة 68 وعطيت سنة 78 للرباعيش لمقارن وما قدرنا نعمل أي شيء فعملوها مدرسة دينية هاي كتب اه اه مدرسه دينيه ما فيش فيها اي شيء بقى. يعني شو اسمه اكثر يعني بقعه جغرافيه فيها كاميرات وداخل بلد قديم حوالي 1500 كاميرا فالواحد وراح يشتكي له بندوره بده يعرف وين راح وين اجى. بالضبط. كيف بكون معي جولات الاجانب بقول له خلصوا انا بتوع مركز الشرطه بتصبوا شريف You see my little brother and my cousin around the houses. And I want to let you see the ترجمة <تصفيق> Hey, 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 لا لا مش عارفه ما احنا بنسوي الحاجه دي عاملين قاطع جهه البستان طلع ايه شو عاملين شو بدنا so we went from the old city to the neighborhoods of Sheikh Jarrah and Silvan then to the limits of, of Greater Jerusalem um, and then of course the gerrymandering wall the close particular and fix certain things from the West Bank into Jerusalem city. So it was eight families uh, um, um, in total um, that uh, them from their from their That's an 88 year old woman. Uh, filming. شو 
ليش هاد هادي هذا الجزء من الجدار بيختلف عن الجزء اللي تحت عشان بين البيوت وهناك كمان بين البيوت بيجي بالشارع بس في بيوت على الجنب ليش هناك معمول من انت بتحكي هذا هون لغايه هون لعند بالضبط ورا هذا البيت وقفوا البلوكس لانه هون فيش بيوت هون شارع وهون احنا اللي طلبنا بين وبينك يعني مش شطرت طلع حكي هذا مكان بدنا نحطه بلوكس عرفتي When the wall was built, they took part of uh, this house's balcony, which we can see now, and uh, part of the house is the border of the wall. Well, they've closed the windows with iron bars, and they put the fence on the roof. There we go. So this is now part of the wall. هي لو تشوف البلكون لسنا يخف عائلته من الأرض آ لس للسطح كله حديد شقة واحد هيك حطه يعني تطلع عليه أنت من بعيد فكري سجن فكري يعني إشي عسكري حصي. مرتب Okay, uh, so that was uh, East Jerusalem and its neighborhoods, which we really recommend as a study of architectural um, um, complexity. Um, it's yeah. actually streaming in a film festival in Toronto tomorrow, I think. So do try to catch it. And this is uh, an older work, but we wanted to give you a sense of the, the spatial sort of dynamic of that. Place, which is a highly contested one, and of course, it leads to very extreme kinds of responses um, as well, which one has to negotiate. Um, the uh, now we are going to briefly in the next section expand this idea of the image, right? So we said there is space, there is an observer who can both actively and passively both receive images and make images, right? Uh, it's not only a passive um, uh, idea, and in that sense connects uh, space and the observer in a, in a kind of matrix. Um, and that's why the image is being used today as a metaphor um, for how to access uh, space, right? It's not the only way, of course. Um, but what if, and this happens very often in the contemporary world, there are no available images, right? Or the images are insufficient. Um, let's look at two quick examples of how we dealt with this. Right? So there is space, there are observers, but there are no images. Um, this is the uh, dock uh, in 2009 in one of the docks on the original traditional Greek side um, of Sharjah, where uh, a lot of uh, the story about a lot of the Gulf cities is that the cannons are facing the desert and the docks are open yeah because uh, so sort of international trade was friendlier than their uh, desert neighbors their, their countrymen today if you like right so these things change and the fact that the cannons are facing in the back I mean, uh, has something to tell us uh, especially but um very quickly uh, we happen to speak the languages that some of these boats in the back were speaking and we asked uh, them where is this going and what you know because there were these sort of images of boxes and, and some overflowing boxes um, that one could sense had some urgency and some madness of of trade and some some opportunity but also some need and so on and they were lying in wait on this fixed side and we were told that we are going to Somalia 
Now, uh, Somalia at the time, uh, certainly, uh, it was also the global financial crisis, so very little world shipping was moving. But at the time, Somalia was very much a pirate story. There were lots of Hollywood productions and all kinds of things saying that, you know, the pirate Tom sea Hanks. of uh, Tom Hanks and uh, various other things, uh, you know, narratives that which convinced you that it is impossible to travel to Somalia by sea, right? But these people were going straight to Somalia uh, carrying stuff. So uh, what we were looking for a way to understand why and how and in what sort of density uh, these materials, you know, dentist chairs and hospital equipment and baby food and uh, generators and machine parts and petrol pumps were going to straight to Somalia, right through what we assumed to be to be piracy. And we looked, talked to a lot of people and we uh, talked to a lot of sailors who were from India, Pakistan, um, Iran, as well, uh, but we didn't uh, get a get a very uh, we didn't get a vivid image what what was inside the box because the sailor like a messenger like a courier does not eat their cargo right they, their their curiosity is traditionally limited I think by training uh, that's one way of putting it the traders were interested in money and were not interested I mean to to, to some extent in the in the kinds of information we were interested in. So the information, the image, if you like, uh, of the inside of the hold as it of the ship traveling to Somalia, we Good found ship. we found elsewhere in the, in the customs records of uh, a small, the small port in Sharjah, which in a in an act of privilege escalation because we were there as part of the biennial, we were allowed to access. Uh, it was at that time still undigitized. Uh, most of it was in Arabic. Here is uh, China uh, sort of camping the, the records. Uh, this was an initial foray into that room, which then through a very complicated process actually of, of group um, uh, Arabic translation and uh, writing software to enable this group to work and literally doing this over very quickly uh, in, in I mean, relatively over a couple of months. We produced a book uh, which we called Warfage, um, which was a calendar of everything, every object that went to Somalia that year. And we were interested in this image of the whole as a form of explicitness or as a form of photography, maybe, uh, for something that was being dismissed as smuggling, right? Because this was clearly, in a, some ways, not smuggling. They were past that word, but this, the records, the vast majority of it was not. And what was it? It was clothes, thermoses, cardamom, paint, uh, lighters, cups, cooking oil, wood, metal rods, food supplies, gifts, baby clothes, refrigerators, blankets, juices, macaroni, Italian, Italian colonial connection, um, and 13 cars. I mean, this is one of these ships going to Paso Panland in, uh, in 2009. Engine oil, air conditioners, bedroom furniture, biscuits, cartons, children's beds, cushions, dates, water, tamarind, tank, television sets, tuna, uh, carrying tuna, coal to Manchester, uh, used clothes, uh, three cars, things like this, right? Uh, an endless, like a world going straight to Somalia, right through pirates. So what, what was going on? And um, I mean, this is just a quick image of us <laughs> to finish the story of the book that this is the ship Kause Vashila made it, it's a wooden ship made by traditional shipbuilders in Gujarat in India, still active in 2009 and very much active today. Uh, this is me. Uh, oh, sorry. This is this is uh, the, the book entry for MSV Kause Vashila um, on the day. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, they can see Okay, you can see the date. Uh, my bar is covering the date, but going to Basaso Puntland, uh, carrying uh, macaroni, shoes, uh, and protein cars. Actually, that date's kind of significant. It's right about when the global financial crisis breaks out, November 2008. And, and this uh, trade has gone. A lot of livestock and a lot of charcoal, environmentally disastrous, but important for Somali sovereignty. You know, all these things are not easy. They are, they are complex uh, politics, but coming back, right? So this is non-NATO, non-world free trade. This is people who have 
who've done this for a couple of thousand years at least, who continue to do this irrespective of whether you call it piracy, smuggling, blah, blah, right? So this is the ship, Kausivashila. Uh, the ship is so great writers and set in themselves. Uh, this is me and uh, uh, a friend of ours who works on so so Somali piracy, also trying to un un undo that definition in front of a pink limousine that uh, had just been brought off uh, the ship from Dubai um, into northern Somalia. Uh, and in the back of the ship uh, is the name Gause Vashila, which is the name of the ship that it was that it came on. And a lot of Toyotas, there's a whole story about why Toyotas are the favorite cars, but, but a lot of stories about uh, taxis having the names of Indian ships um, in northern Somalia and elsewhere uh, written on them in indelible white ink because of the way that they were transported. Right? So point was that the image uh, that was inside this book, the image of the hold was a very different kind of image and a different kind of speciality was opened up through it. Uh, we presented this book and a radio project, which is beaming an FM transmission from a ship actually uh, at the Sharjah Biennial in 2009, we, we received the the grand prize or whatever of that uh, of that year but i think the idea was that the the, the reality of the project like it's not a thing you display you know in the, in a traditional sense right it's something that's floating on the airwaves and it's entering the customs room back there and via that the holes of ships to open it up to others and and for everyone in a way and, and it was interesting that people in gujarat would show me this book later in india saying, hey, you know, uh, somebody wrote about what we do. Um, that's just one example. Uh, of course, uh, this means the, the effectiveness of that image and its uniqueness meant that we got a lot of all kinds of weird mail, including from NATO saying, you know, we are very interested in this data um, since it provided one of the only glimpses we have of trade routes and da, da, da. They had a very bad um, classification system and we refused to sort of help them out to to, to, to make a clean distinction because between what they call pirates uh, and what they call smugglers and what they call normal traders, right? Because those distinctions are not on the terms that NATO would recognize. Uh, so we said, no, no, uh, you know, uh, go away. Uh, we got lots of other security agencies uh, writing to us. It's just an example. Um, and here again, um, we'll, uh, we'll take another 15 minutes maybe to give you a few more modern example, like contemporary examples of what's, what, what, what we, how we deal with this via the problems that we set out. We are looking for this image um, and sometimes the image is, is a strange thing, right? For us, the image is, is a construction. It's, uh, it's a mix between what is found and constructed. And here uh, is another example where in 2011, there was a set of, uh, and this is drawing you closer to our home context, um, there was a set of um, uh, phone calls uh, between a lobbyist and figures in government, figures in uh, the news media, very high up, that were recorded by our government, uh, a certain department, income tax department, and then were leaked by a, um, by a newspaper. Uh, this is also the time of WikiLeaks and a lot of uh, the leak itself as a phenomenon outside of networks, right? Network thinking means there everything is just a node. Here, the, it's escaping from all the nodes. It's going in all kinds of directions. And what we uh, wanted to do here was because it was a very, uh, very specific, again, very much like Warfage, the book example. We were already dealing in databases as an extension of our, um, you know, filmmaking uh, and, and other kind of archival. Um, interest. So, you know, as you know, from birth of filmmaking is, is from a database, right? So here we, we, we are starting to collect and analyze uh, 185 um, phone calls, uh, which we then turn into a, a quite fun uh, thing, I think. Uh, this is a, a, a view of the exhibition uh, in Calcutta, where people are reading a screenplay that is generated like a threat of making a film out of this and that is generated from the from the phone taps and also hearing live uh, not live but you can call in and like a and ask for a particular scene on the phone and it will play you the, the original leaked recording um here is uh, in 
in in Eflux, New York, which is a place that might be familiar to some of you, um, a, a reading of that screenplay, a trying to translation of Indian politics and corruption for different audiences. Uh, so this kind of work then travels in different worlds, but it, its origins are from a way of finding something imagistic, uh, something surprising, something compelling uh, to turn something that is just data into an image, right? Even with, with Warfage, we didn't sit and analyze the quantities of material. We turned them into some kind of uh, irreducible uh, uh, images. Which brings us back to, um, uh, well, uh, let me just show you what we do with that. Uh, one of the things was that we set up uh, um, a database that then was crowdsourced transcription at that point, but this was very deep that you could search for you know, the appearance of every word in the transcript of all these things and eventually. Uh, and al alongside this, uh, you can see at the white part, the, the, there are four references to word port in that one phone call. You know, so you're literally, and, and this uh, around 2011 is already a mature form of what we were developing as a footage archive called Padma. And uh, this is a use of it um, using audio material only, but then trying to use filmic techniques uh, to describe all kinds of things, including housing. Uh, so we'll get we'll get to that in a second. Uh, so so kind of a, a different sets of exhibition techniques, right? So alongside no available images are obviously in the course of this two decades too many images, uh, and uh, the question of the ownership of images and how to unown or public domain, uh, how to remove the idea of property, uh, you know. For especially for things like media, that is increasingly, as as you all know, a problem with with large platform capitalism, right? So Padma and uh, other things we are presenting in the next five minutes are are examples of how to how to de-own uh, or how to think of ownership in a different, completely different way. Okay, um, that's pad.ma. It's a website which you can visit. It has a lot of very interesting urban uh, politics material, uh, most of it from India, but um, also there are sister projects. And we'll get you, uh, we'll get you back in a second in the last example to how we've used it. Go back to... So um, here we are at camp, and um, I wish we could have been there to uh, uh, do this talk today, but we're at home. Um, this is reverse angle of our main studio uh, room. Um, Xenia, uh, who's sysadmin admin of all the archives, is sitting on that monitor um, in that, what might look familiar to you, the Padma interface. Um, on the table there is, if you could see, is the kind of hard drive and a, behind this naked boy, is a joystick. So we're back into our CCTV landscape. Um, and this weird infrared image is actually of um, a CCTV camera mounted on a modified 35 millimeter, uh, I mean, a 35 mm uh, ARRI camera tripod, but uh, it's clearly a CCTV camera and it's looking at the landscape of our city. So this is 2017, um, that $300 camera is now um, HD, the NVRs are digital and their storage capacity is whatever terabytes you put in the, the recorders. Um, and our city um, finally has thousands of them um, and the police have this uh, you know, complete uh, nat grid kind of uh, monitoring uh, dream right or wet dream to have complete digital surveillance so here we are at the at, um, impossible images and what could you do um, when you are to use an acronym for cam in a city where there are more cameras than people, right? Or what is cinema 
at the time with more cameras than people. So this is the opening um, of the Mami Film Festival in 2017. It's one of the opening nights. And uh, Camp has put that camera that you just saw on the roof of another mall with a very sordid history. Um, the first mall to come up uh, with the murder of our mill areas, uh, Phoenix Mill becomes Phoenix Mall, right? And this, 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 uh, uh, this uh, uh, slowly parceling out and selling out of Phoenix Mill to become Phoenix Mall lay the blueprint of how our industrial heartland in Bombay, which was called Girangao, the village of 56 mills, uh, at with the neoliberalization turn and post the largest and longest worldwide lockdown coordinated industrial strike um, in the 80s um, leads to massive transformation right uh, for ale the land of mills becomes upper worldly which is the name of its more upper uh, um, um, uh, wealthy more affluent western west side neighborhood um that's three of us ashok myself and a colleague uh, inside an imac theater in the city in phoenix mills um and the camera is above like in palestine on the roof in 1891 a balloon carrying a lieutenant mansfield who belonged to the royal navy developed a leak while at about 1000 feet and fell And let's call this moment our descent into Lower Parade. Parachute opened partially, but didn't stop him from falling. Strange marks appeared. <coughs> he remembered his corpse. He got closer to the ground. at last. And yes, the inevitable happened. He died. If he had fallen 150 years before that, or for that matter, any time before 1784, then it could be that he would have escaped death. Because it could have been that he would have landed in water. And as we find in this rather beautiful model of Bombay pre-1784, this model. The center of what we call the island from Dharavi in the north to Girgaon in the south, from Wali in the west to Paidhani, Paidhani ki jagah in the east was sea. And this was us towards the end of the live event, but we actually played it during the live event. The three of us campers leaving the mall, promising never ever to go back there again. And thus far, that's been true. Um, so yeah, we did this intervention and told a 200 year history. 
these things come with sacrifices. Um, Ashok does it, can't go to the UAE. We choose not to enter this mall ever again, and so on. Um, I'm going to skip in the interest of times. I was going to take you to Amsterdam, um, where we um, um, worked with a 4K camera. You see how we how how this ecology also keeps changing. Why on earth is a CCTV camera 4K? That's so that it can zoom in and find all your faces and do multiple face rec, uh, number, keep zooming in and grab every number plate that it sees, um, and so on, right? So that data valence also needs a certain kind of, but there's Lucy uh, pointing to the Rikes Academy and this 4K camera listens to her and goes up there in the sky uh, to Rikes Academy and the rain, rain clears up. And there's Skjord, um, who wears his green jacket all the time so that the CCTV camera can find him, um, watching um, um, the landscape um, and where power comes to uh, the city of Amsterdam. Um, this camera somehow is being controlled by uh, certain subjects in the city, right? Um, it's grey um, and the birds are in thermal and the light clears up and there's Shord in his green jacket staring at us um, and there are planes going off to Schiphol This was a work called In Cameras Res, but we parasited the archive, the Stad archive, which is the largest city archive. Um, that's us in the control room, uh, sending these feeds and the camera control to uh, a number of colleagues and comrades in the city. Uh, so we were on the archive and we were in the Adam Tower, which was the building of the Royal Dutch Shell Corporation. So again, mounting ourselves in these impossible locations. And here we are, this is very raw. You can see the shake in the camera, we're still tweaking it. Uh, this is Bombay, and this is an image from yesterday. Um, and we are now on top of the Four Seasons Hotel on the 33rd floor. And this tilt down is taking you through. I didn't speak over the earlier part of the, uh, the, the tall building you saw, but it's home to four of the country's biggest scamsters. The Yes Bank collapsed, a diamond uh, uh, mogul uh, goes AWOL and had causes four more banks to collapse. A housing mogul uh, causes a akin to subprime mortgage crisis, but it's called a slum uh, rehabilitation crisis. And as we till down, we are on more reclaimed land. As Ashok said, we landed in water. Now we're landing on a bizarre thing called a coastal road that's reclaiming our western waterfront uh, for no rhyme or reason, really. And the sea level's rising and this crazy reclamation was going on. That was the sports club of India, the National Sports Club of India, and behind it, transit camps. These particular typology of these rooms with grills are transit camps. So they've been there forever, which means people are living in this sort of waiting town in transit camps. Um, the greenery is part of our sewage treatment facility. So you see the density of images in this just this one till town, right? How do you read the city? This is work in progress. This is our questions we are asking ourselves, right? Um, here's a giant. She's watching over the city. She has benevolent eyes, but she sees completely unequal weird things. Um, we just passed the filtration sewage treatment plant, and now we're in the back building of uh, the Nehru Science Center, a early public institution which avowed some of our early post-colonial dreams of being a rational, modernist, uh, 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 thinking nation, body. yeah, the history of from evolution on is housed in this uh, somewhat forgotten institution. Um, so, 
this is still the same shot as uh, in, it's as just tilting down see? it's the same like a single slice of um, that's our black and yellow cabs uh, still downtown alive Bombay. despite uber so it's just an image we we wanted to share with you and we'll close with the last section uh, just very short uh, and the drain if that's right? still okay yeah. the, our our sewage uh, uh, treatment sluice gates open and close and let this water out into this what we call nala or drain and we come to what while we were filming this a young boy uh, uh, from this locality it's called jija mata nagar said uh, this is the heart of worli right that jija mata nagar is worli's heart the neighborhood we're uh, uh, looking at And you can see split air conditioning units, water tanks um, in these one room uh, tenements. It's a, it's a density of, of uh, uh, That's Bombay's. That's Masjid and Madrasa there is Islam. <clears throat> yeah, we were there yesterday. Quite shaky. Yeah, it was windy. CCTV, uh, yeah, cell phone towers on the left. And a temple top. Uh, yesterday was the last day of, of uh, the Ganesh itself. So there's the Ganesh temple. And the moment you hit floor level, you see those familiar things, right? Um, four cameras on one pole, but they're there all over at street ah. level, right? They're familiar things by now to all of us. So that's street level COVID vaccination center on the left, um, fruit vendors. That almost looks like the map <laughs> I should found on, on the rooftop. Found Someone being made. made. Someone being uh, uh, rainwater harvesting, being clever by keeping the tap open. Uh, and if we have two more minutes, uh, we just end here with the final uh, proposition. Uh, we are using images here as a as a, just a way of you know one way of 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 talking about the the things here which are really about um, uh, forms of access right forms of creativity forms of access and forms of understanding uh, what actually exists and what you can do within it uh, one of the categories that is obvious and isn't discussed yet and actually is a lot of our work. Uh, is is this question of density, right? So one is that these uh, these strange cameras and they, they produce an impossible subject position, right? It's not the traditional observer in that sense. Right? Um, uh, these things have been virtualized, uh, of course, but it's a, we 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 have a certain discipline about how we want to virtualize them. Uh, in terms of density, I uh, just wanted to share one thing which is relevant and maybe you guys can get into. Uh, uh, we, we also run a, a, a sister project of Padmas for, for six or seven years, which is a sort of a semi, well, by now uh, accepted but unauthorized uh, repository of uh, all of Indian film online. Uh, it has um, the, you can see on the top of that image, 63,000 films, uh, entries for 63,000 films of which increasingly uh, by now about uh, 10,000 have um, actual video attached to them uh, and so on. And we do, what we are proposing is that it's a way of reading, for example, the city of Bombay in a completely different way than say sociology texts or anthropologists or the usual sort of expert knowledge people um, read uh, cities and these because they were popular cinema and because a lot of Indian cinema had had a lot of uh, revolutionary 
writers, um, poets, uh, and sort of outcasts from mainstream culture. Uh, it's an interesting social space from which to speak from, right? Now, uh, very briefly, we wanted to show how this kind of thing uh, shows up. You know, again, there's three of us, Simpreet, who's not here, is a housing activist, has been uh, instrumental in the demise of at least one Bombay chief minister. Uh, was in the resignation, not, <laughs> not death. Uh, but but, but uh, here's the three of us again, you know, assembling uh, stories, uh, telling argument, uh, arguments, uh, making cases uh, for various things. But in this That's case, our rooftop. this is our rooftop and we are presenting to a group of architecture students, actually the whole of the senior uh, um, of a new architecture college in Bombay called the School of Environment and Architecture. Uh, a, a one part of a somewhat epic, uh, I think it's a total of six hour uh, now online, uh, story of the house, story of housing in, in, in Bombay, right? From the 50s approximately to now. And here is an image of a newspaper that is from a very famous, like the uh, definitive uh, sort of, so far considered definitive housing trajectory, uh, so, sorry, housing film, um, in Mumbai, Paul Hamara Shaher, Diana Prakrozan, and that is an image of that from that film. But let's look behind that image uh, and give you an example of how uh, we are finding things and uh, sharing them, right? Again, we have no sort of uh, fundamental right to access these things, right? We are doing so this is the collection of Ofranavaz is collecting court cases in Indian cinema and there's 400 films that are dealing with court, court cases, which is interesting. Here is that image which was playing on a rooftop inside indiancine.ma, which is this website, where we can go behind that image, just a little bit rewind and see, um, okay, this is what was happening, this is the story of that night where there's, a, there's an order by the Supreme Court in the morning that allows a certain uh, must be a certain settlement to survive. Okay? Now, uh, this Indian cinema uh, allows us to take that part that is marked yellow in the timeline and to take it out of its original context in that film and stick it next to a bunch of other contexts that we got from elsewhere, including the newspapers, the actual newspaper that says that, uh, but also a lot of other types of uh, material, including the person who, you know, started the court case, uh, which was being shown in that film uh, much later. And here's the paper of that day, right? So, what I mean is, to repeat, we have taken the active out of the original film, and placed it in a space where a lot of other contexts can be attached to it. Right? And we create this very dense sort of history of, uh, uh, or a dense way of looking at what we earlier thought to be primary. If you want to learn about housing in Bombay, you watch Hamara Shair. But Hamara Shair itself has a complicated backstory, which in the film is not very clear. And so, we are excavating a lot of these things via archival practice. And, and this is a screenshot of our website. And this is that image alive with all of us. So just to end with that, uh, this is uh, Gharme Shairona. It's a, it's a website, web, web, it's online uh, history of housing in Bombay. Um, oops. Uh, and you can see it at ghar.with.camp, which we will put into the text right here so that you can have a look at it uh, and you, it's an annotated history of uh, of Bombay from the 70s uh, from the 50s uh, to the future hopefully in that last bit coming soon okay we've gone a little bit over time but I hope we, we've some of no, you no, have... no 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 uh, a, a brilliant presentation in fact uh, and I saw a number of your uh, uh, videos uh, where you're interviewed and I know that there's such uh, depth, and I mean that you know, on the most genuine level, with uh, both the thought and the craft intrinsic to the work that we could probably speak for a couple of hours. 
Uh, the first thing I would say to the uh, students, uh, feel free to put a question together and put that in the box. Um, I will, in the chat box, uh, I have a number of uh, questions, maybe observations. Uh, and uh, the first one, I'm just gonna uh, read it out if you don't mind. Uh, much of the work uh, within camp utilizes the medium of film and video as the primary means of your investigative research and cultural commentary. Within this context, there's an extraordinary amount of creative and intellectual capital assigned to a broad range of cinematic techniques, i.e. camera positions and post-editing, et cetera, and their affects in relation to the production of meaning. It appears that your use of cinematic techniques is operating on a number of levels simultaneously. They're didactic systems that are critiquing the status quo, that is the specific cultural context that you're dealing with at the time. But as filmmakers, you're also mindful of the historical and contemporary precedents of cinematic techniques. So your films are also working within this historical continuum to expose the nefarious techniques of control that are often un seen by the general population due to the exploitative agenda of cinema in popular culture. Uh, for instance, I'm reminded of uh, Joel Peter Witkin, the renowned American photographer of the grotesque that scratched the four by five film in order to intensify the aura of disbelief or the film persona by Igmar Bergman who literally lit the cellulose of the film on fire to increase the gravity of the psychotic uh, behavior, which was the subject of the film. Can you speak to the simultaneity intrinsic to your filmic craft? In other words, there's the medium as a carrier of messages and, there, and then there's the sensibility of aura of the delivery system itself, the cinematic aesthetic in your work. Yeah, uh, not, not, not trying to, I, and, and I mean, it, 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 I, I should have prefaced by saying that, you know, like a magician uh, and you used, uh, maybe you were, it's so interesting, so much of the uh, work uh, talked about material and immaterial states. It talked about things that you can't find, they're inside those containers and boxes. Uh, you're trying to uh, decipher things that that are at a distance or reside within a technological realm that are uh, inaccessible and often highly complex. And I and I want to speak uh, in particular about your impossible uh, uh, images. And to me, they're kind of a radical departure because they they introduce a kind of inflection, a swerve. Uh, in your work where there isn't uh, such a clear target for the analysis and the commentary, it, it's opened up for a lot of space of interpretation and it's kind of like a beautiful a game of chance. I'm talking about uh, your that particular project where you collect a range of sites that, um, uh, that create a kind of combinatory strip vertical strip and it wasn't predicted that's my sense and that's the beauty of it because it kind of forces you to rethink what this this uh excess of accumulation might mean so, uh, so much of your work it is is living within two worlds and and that is that is uh, uh, targeting uh the subject in relation to the observer and then the bias that the the systems of observing bring uh, to the work itself. And that's the cinematic aesthetic to, to me is, 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 is an attempt to, to try to under, for me, to try to understand the complexity of the game that you're playing, which is really quite loaded. Yeah. I mean, since you, you um, took us back to that moment of structural filmmaking and experimental cinema, right? Like, I'd like to bury or scratch, uh, uh, you know, bury as Brackage did. I'd bury my film through the winter in my backyard and dig it up to see what happened. 
and what that decay did to the image or scratches and, and so on. Um, so there's there's a structure, there's a, for, a desire, uh, but the form is contingent, right? That that has to emerge and 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 happen through that process. I think in that sense, when when we set up what I was trying to say in this kernel, right? This this setting, the spatial intervention that happens uh, first in the interplay between the subject, author, um, and um, and the technology. Um, we don't know the outcome, mm -hmm. but the sort of politics of it, uh, the way that cinematic apparatus has to lean and tweak, be tweaked in a certain way. So the scopic arrangement uh, um, has an invitation and a moment to happen differently. These are quite structural. They're right. extremely formal. And they take that planning, right? Like, okay, get iris scan, get into the control room, take that camera, but you don't want to be the 1600th filmmaker making the victim narrative about Palestinian residents, but you want to stay with the trouble and go. You better have a clear set of, 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 of things uh, uh, and a certain uh, uh, politics at play. You need to articulate what happens, but yes, you're most excited about the modified landscape and the new set of images that will emerge. And within that, since uh, uh, both the, the infrastructural landscape, right? Like Ashok said, we can't say, yeah, it's everywhere. And like, yeah, whatever, we now live in controlled societies down to our phones and Google. What can you do? Be more specific, try to map it, try to change a few things. Um, when we do that, um, which sounds maybe very technical and very spatial, and it has its elements of activism and architecture and grumpiness all built into it, at the heart is really cinema, right? You want the surprise. You want the complete magic and you know the, 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 pan the city modified at that moment of filming as a landscape to unfold. Um, so that's that's really the surprise, right? We we set these things up, and then they happen, right? Some people have called it intervention, public art, um, spatial practices, relational, blah blah. For us, it's filmmaking, right? It's making art. It's and so it might be read and put into you know critics see it differently, but really for us, it's uh, 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 create a new image. But of course, it is loaded. It has to be equitable. Yes. It has to, I mean, it has all these things loaded into it, but it has to have the jouissance and magic and but I think unpredictability just, yeah. of no, cinema. No, no, no. no, that's also, uh, 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 I mean, that's also Shaina speaking. <laughs> speaking. Yeah. Uh, uh, what I meant to add was that uh, there's a sort of moment where, I mean, the way, also, I've enjoyed and worked with this expanded idea of the image. It's a very, in some ways, uh, it's a very basic uh, curiosity of the, the, the fact that, that you were able to, in the room camera obscuras of the 18th century, 17th century, you were able to look out outside of your body, right? You were able to look out of the top of this building, sort of out in, into the sea, right, or mm. into the into the beach, and of course, uh, very quickly, the people who ran these things as commercial establishments began to hire people to to, to act as lovers outside. So people wanted to look out at them, and you know, this whole very very quickly became very complex, right? So what what we like to say is when you change the ground a little bit, right, of what you are doing when you shift the ordinary techniques suddenly a whole set of new complexities that had been evolved out right that, that have been sort of pushed out of the door by the push of technological evolution and instagram and you know suddenly all these kind of things suddenly come back in to the door right when you so that's kind of what happens when you open the door backwards right to the up to the to where is this image coming from? Like backwards integration, right up to the archives, into the pixels, into 
you know, into the electric system. So, and then you open all those things backwards up, right? In the attempt of producing a new image, new kind of image, let's say in this in this metaphor, we could also talk about new kinds of networks, but that's a separate subject. Uh, but in this way of uh, creating a new kind of image, all these other things that have been evolved out, like the live speaker, for example, or you know this this kind of strange like long tilts down from the sky into the ground and this kind of 300x zooms and all these kind of strange things that have been out possible in cinema but have been uh, <laughs> removed from cinema culture come back flooding in as possibilities and I think that's where the some of the joy of that uh, lives and that I think is a very interesting thing for for architects for some spatial um, knowledge right because it's not some like like pure virtuality sort of thing but it's mm -hmm. very it's virtual in the, in, a, in a different sense. So yeah, I think I think it's quite fundamental, and we want to open it up backwards. Uh, we want to open it up into the infrastructures of of craft. Uh, so that's why things like the archive. That's why we uh, some things up like you know, we work inside the cameras. We work in the city. We set up the buildings sometimes where these things are housed. A lot of. Uh, overlapping uh, possibilities re-emerge that had been excised at the moment of of cinema right uh, of commercial cinema let's say no no i listen i thank you uh i'm a i should have started my comments out by saying i'm a big fan of your work i have uh, enormous uh, uh re respect uh for your commitment uh to to a search in search of truth I mean, when you when one thinks of of of, of the kind of uh, moral ineptitude that that permeates society and and even enters into the art world, there, there's something beautifully uh, refreshing uh, about your ethical position. And and uh, Shana, I, I thought your comment, you know, hey, I also want you to know we're dealing with cinema and there's this art and and you didn't use the word magic but in, in a certain sense in order to communicate on a profound and uh memorable level there has to be some uh, uh exchange of a kind of poetic imagination here too because many of the uh topics that you're dealing with um are uh, very difficult uh uh, disquieting, to say the least, threatening, uh, and um, and require action. So, so it's fascinating. But I, I, I kind of started with the question of of the aesthetics of cinema, and I'll give some other examples. I'm reminded of early uh, military photography, where they used to attach cameras to the feet of birds, pigeons. Uh, uh, in order to cross the border. And, and so you not, in, in fact, um, yeah. And, and what was uh, interesting is that you would get the, the, the filmic material footage back and you would not only read it in terms of uh, what kind of factual information you could decipher from the footage that would enable you to participate in this horrible game of war, but you also had the simultaneous registration of the pigeon as an animal, right? That that, that kind of uh, uh, point of reference was inextricably part of that. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's interesting that, that on some level you're, the, the material that is, uh, becomes the kind of final record of the research attempts on one level to feel natural as though there's no author um, that that it, in in the in in light of the comment about truth, it's trying to uh, get to a certain uh, essence and and a kind of perfection of what is in fact happening as a phenomena, as a social condition. But on the other hand, as you look more closely, there are many moments where you're intervening in, in the process, and so that intervention becomes a kind of fascinating question. So, for example, we spoke about uh, the use of the camera and the post editing, but there's also this beautiful feedback loop in your 
in your creative practice uh, where you may go to a site, but you, uh, the film then, or a portion of that site gets recreated into an art space. And so it, it, it raises the question of the frame of, of how you de uh, decide how to reappropriate it and re-message it to, an, uh, to a larger audience or a different audience within a totally different context. You, you've got the films and then you've got the room within which the film or the screen or the L LED, whatever it is, uh, is to reside. Maybe you could speak a little bit about that feedback loop and some of the, the, the challenges, the complexities that emerge as a result of migrating now to, to another kind of political space. I'll say one uh, short thing and then, uh, so the, the first option is to not migrate too much, uh, for example, uh, which means that, for example, we, because of the, because of what, uh, what, what doesn't travel, let's say, right? Um, so, so, um, there are many things we, we didn't show today, but one of the things that we that were quite uh, interesting for us in regard to this strange eye was um, we made a film over a year with uh, over one year or so uh, with a group of people who are volunteer Coast Guard uh, on the English Channel. And they had all these telescopes and this gear that they were using to um, assist the official postcard I and mean, this is uh, in the context of big society and the kind of uh, let's participate in in neighborhood policing but also in activating old, old people who are in the navy and so on but they also knew the fishermen very well and so on so this this thing that we made we just showed it in the in the back room of that coast guard cabin which is a bunker you know and which is not normally a place that you would invite visitors and so on right so part of the, the this escalation kind of agenda as well is that this opening up of that kind of space uh, as a space of reception, as a space of dialogue, right? And the production of art, right? So, so in a way, when you don't migrate the the, the art objects, they be, then you they begin to see the process of making stuff and the process of watching stuff as not necessarily cleanly separated right you 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 are people are watching and making and and watching again you know so that's there are small loops and there are bigger loops so that was an example where obviously it's a form of caring for where this goes right and, and trying to uh and in a way trying to uh, um, uh invite in uh once we had the the access or the privilege of opening out that that door and on that rocky hill on top of you know which we have no business like people in a world, you know, war, two in a world mm -hmm. war two bunker you know we, we are living in bombay we are not you know but but somehow we are able to sort of burrow into that space then we want to open it up and and and, and have that um the speciality of that also experience so just so one extreme example in that in that sense was was to not separate them in that way and production reception is part of the same movement right it has different times and comes and goes but that site is both the site from which you see right. and the site where you where you see alongside the things it's also the site where it's like the old Comer obscura room you could go out and look at the beach anyway but there was a magic in watching that those waves you know, horizontally projected onto the table, for example, I mean, that's the simplicity. Mm -hmm. So now, but, but China has a more, I mean, there, there are more sophisticated forms of dispersion, of course, distribution and, and caring for where it goes. But, but at root, you can also say that they're the same moment, uh, the production of artwork and the reception of it. And, uh, and there's something beautiful about trying to experience both at the same time. No, no, I mean, I, listen, it, like, like your, your notation, your diagram, to, to understand your project in its totality is to continue to uh, 
reposition, reposition yourself from different vantage points. I, I think there's a, an inherent flux in the work when you spoke about images, no images, uh, I, what, what was it, uh, uh, unowned images, impossible images, dense images. Fantastic, <laughs> the thesis is great. It, but, and, uh, but, but it's, it's just interesting since uh, you're the, the kinds of, uh, uh, you serve as messengers, the kind of beautiful poetic messengers for the kind of uh, contested and problematic social conditions that reside today. Um, it, it's, it, I'm thinking of, uh, of Banksy who, whose practice uh, uh, moved from a kind of uh, informal grassroots guerrilla operation on the street. You, you, literally you had to leave the museum and, and, and walk the streets to discover his work and, uh, and only through the word of mouth or complete circumstance might you find it. Now he's decided to go into the gallery. I mean, there's something in his case perverse because they actually- uh, And also- they, 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 they take fungible tokens. <laughs> oh my God, they take the part of the building away and then ship it to, you know, to Pompidou and it's put on a pedestal. So these are, I mean, it's really interesting. You, one has to go to the biennales. I think it's really important. I think one has to go inside the, in the center of the institutions of power. And yet uh, in order you can, you get to uh, uh, assume a position both in the margin and in the center. But I, I imagine it's, it's also, it raises problematics for you. Right, you don't want work uh, people to fetishize it. You don't want it to, them to uh, misinterpret it. You you don't want them to to kind of uh, I don't know maybe based on the fact that they're illiterate or there's not enough uh, uh, generosity. Uh, again, I'm talking about which which kind of audience you have. Yeah, I mean, I I'd, I'd like to say that we. Uh, um, we uh, believe in this notion of the emancipated spectator, right? And that, 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 that the audience, wherever it may be, in that back room of the Coast Watch cabin or in the big art institution, is sensible enough to receive this work. And, and has information there that allows them to understand what is going on. And um, in, <clears throat> for us, one way, and this goes from how we're not on Facebook and Instagram to literally the nuts and bolts of how we work with images. Um, one way to not be captured is to be free, right? Or to set things free. Right, right, right. And I think, um, and by capture, we really mean algorithmic, institutional, uh, uh, be read in a certain way, right? So uh, sometimes our work is very like quicksilver. People try, but where does it belong, right? And again, I think for us, uh, of course, this is just all mapped in, in a certain practice, um, but it goes back to that arrangement, right? So uh, you have the subject, always graceful, open to someone coming to do something from the outside. That's us, the author, the artist, the filmmaker, and the technology, right? So we're doing all the cut and, and that's the that's the first that's the moment of encounter. And since you spoke of feedback loops, you know, almost all these projects, they're screen at the very beginning. This is a lens. So there's no authorial lens and a missing image for the subject. Right. The subjects at, are viewing the screen real time. That's just the basic fundamental beauty of video. You can see it. Um, and we you were, don't have to process it you in don't, the lab. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or, um, which is a different thing right? so the first cinematic encounter with that image is for the subjects like the people in the control room or the Palestinian residents or post watchers or the sailors we worked with right so that 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 surface of the image is on the tv screen as they're controlling the joystick and that's the first instance um in the second stage comes a lot of editing and that's where this invisible author is playing like the quicksilver like mm. 
you're not you're saying things but you're like there is a craft there um so the the subject becomes footage the author becomes cutter you know and and so the this this whole subject author technology continues to play and finally there's a screen and an audience they're also the subject and for us they're they they keep zooming out to right. that universal audience where uh we hope or at least there's a there's a concerted endeavor for it to escape capture. And by this, I mean the ethnographic dilemmas of working with certain uh, 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 subaltern uh, societies, certain class differences, um, or extremely uh, uh, risky situations at some times, working with police, working with, with the um, sailors going to Somalia, um, and so on. So I the um, at each stage, right? And there's, since we run the footage archive, uh, right. we always had this this uh, maths that said ever since video went mini DV and digital, and we entered this digital you know river, river of time one fine day, right? Like across the world, it didn't take some fifty years post colonialization. Digital entered all our worlds like together, right? This went straight. Um, for for. Uh, um, for every, roughly, it's changed the ratio. I still have an old school ratio in my head. But for every 60 minute film, there's 100 hours of footage, right? So there's 99 hours of unused footage. And for us to believe that filmmaking needs to be beautiful, not just on the outside, which is your dressed up, finished cut, nicely post produced, but on the inside as well. So back to that kernel, back to that moment of image. And if it's beautiful, then that footage or the 99 hours is probably more important or more valuable in every sense of the, 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 the meaning of value um, than just this authored cut, right? right? So that's where Padma came from, that if we care for the 99 hours, they are beyond our current politics and our remit. They contain truths that will last more than your authorial yeah. cut. And we need to care for this, right? That that's sort of the backstory of why we said, and instead of just us caring, if all of us in the region as filmmakers and artists and cultural workers can do it, yeah. we have a non-state archive of the everyday, the magical, the cinematic, the ethical. Also, the it's a, it's a position where we don't have the the BBC that the, that the, that Adam Curtis uses, right, as his. Uh, as a sort of uh, play play pool, right? We, we we build it backwards. That's also another meaning of of the escalation of privilege back into you know this kind of. So obviously we are not the BBC, right? We are not that big, but we our little film archive is, uh, as we like to say, these these couple of years is larger than the National Film Archive of India, right? So it has some some meaning in the sense that you know we built something like backwards uh, out, uh, which which then has some continuity with the practices, but also you know uh, allows us to operate in a different way than being a uh, say specialist journalism filmmaker that say somebody like Adam Curtis is with access to a specialist to to an archival source, say the BBC. Here it's 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 more complex and it's driven by lots of uh, sort of individual artistic agendas of what gets worked on and what is annotated and you know like all of that. So it's a very good example in some ways of an artist-run infrastructure, right? Where yeah. the values are different from say the state broadcast corporation. Um, now that you you raise I mean, the yes, but everybody who works on it, which is more than us. Right, right. You, you mentioned the BBC. Um, a, a number of, uh, so uh, the work deals with these contested spaces and I'm reminded of the Manchester project where I imagine there was an elaborate uh, set of events that took place behind the scenes in order to be permitted to get access to that, that room. And, and then I would imagine there were uh, uh, certain uh, documents that uh, had to be agreed upon in the context of extracting 
uh, video footage uh, that left the box uh, and went out into the public domain. Can, can you, I'm not sure how to phrase this, can you, can you speak about the kinds of uh, regulatory uh, barriers and protocols that you have had to manage in, in order to move into these contested spaces and places that actually constitute danger. I, I, for example, in, in this entire presentation, when you showed uh, the uh, video equipment that was located on top of the roof in Jerusalem, uh, with the background uh, uh, being this, you know, this kind of epic uh, beginning of Western civilization, the juxtaposition, no, and no, knowing full well the, the kinds of uh, danger, uh, 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 the, the, uh, how should I say it, the kinds of associations one might have by looking at any piece of equipment with wires and boxes and machines in that context is, is totally loaded. So I'm just, I, maybe I use that as a case uh, point uh, as a reference, but I'm just, yeah, I'm interested to hear uh, the, uh, there's a whole performance that you have to uh, kind of straddle and manage and, and work through in, in order to get access to certain places and then move uh, image material uh, out of one territory into another territory. Yeah, um, the curator of Documenta 13 um, appreciated how we work because it was Arte Povera, which means it's done on very little means. Um, you know, it's literally done on that privilege of very small at that point, right? That was early on in our career, um, invitations and, and commissions. Um, that particular site in Jerusalem that you're talking about, if you see our film, the last scene ends with all that doubt and fear that pervaded our project of watching, right. because um, from Hefa Khaldi's house, and she's the only um, 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 remaining, remaining uh, Arabic resident in the Jewish quarter, um, uh, She's filming um, this uh, like gun parade, um, and they're like just shaking their guns. They're just doing a military exercise, but under the camera, everyone's caught their breaths, and we're all gasping. We're like, what are we filming? Oh my god! And then she's yeah, like, yeah. you know, so that that that, um, and then we're like, why the hell do we get a fluorescent orange power cable? Like, couldn't we, you know, like because you saw in that picture. So there is like, like, like not to be cocky or, or romantic, but um, there is this nimble footed, uh, um, very resource light uh, way we work, right? right? And Italy, it often it involves us on top of the rooftops, hanging the cables, Ashok would always say getting you know, like these min minor electric shocks on our fingers. Um, an, an, an example would be um, how we went to Afghanistan in 2012 to work with the film archive there. Right. Um, so you have all this heavy infrastructure, right, of, of post-war aid and reconstruction. Re uh, um, and the French archive agency, INA, has airdropped this digitizing telecine machine on the Afghan archive. But hey, they gave them a machine whose last part had not been manufactured in 1986, because it's just like aid, and it stopped working, right? So right. here's an archiving machine, and it, it doesn't work. Uh, but we find the technician in Bombay who flies with Ashok. He says, the only thing I can't carry in my pocket or is isopropyl alcohol because we need to clean the sprockets, make sure we get that cable. Um, and he's carried, he knows what's going wrong. He's carried so sprockets. He's carried thin muslin cloth to clean things. And in four weeks, some... we digitize 100 reels. We annotate them with the staff who hasn't seen the cinema archive. 
uh, so that they a... themselves filmed in the 60s, right? And the curator is like, Ate Povera, she's happy. <laughs> oh, but, but, the, but the meaning of that is, yeah, the, the, that's the question. I mean, I don't necessarily mind. But the point is that it's a sort of non-alienated art, right? Like you're not saying, okay, this is my production. Deep intimacy. Yeah. It's being produced in whatever workshop somewhere. And, you know, there's a sort of chain. It doesn't have to be literally us tightening the screws on everything. It often is, but right. but, but even from the very first you know thing we showed, there's a lot of regulatory uh, landscape which says, for example, that you cannot cross electricity over a street in the, uh, in the city, right? You cannot have your electrical connection being thrown across to the neighbors right? and things like that. But of course, then there are ways to, to negotiate that or to render it differently or to make it appear as if that is the case or to perform like the military were performing in Jerusalem for us to perform as artists. And, you know, there's a, there's a game, right? I mean, there's an ongoing uh, tussle of of appearances and, mm -hmm. and 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 actions actually, which um, are part of what constitutes um, sort of culture in a in a, in a, in a we use an old word right I mean, I mean that's what uh, the challenge is that we are also performing our roles we are showing you new spaces we are telling you you can cross the street with electricity and a hundred houses can share it. Or, or you know uh, this kind of uh, the imaginations of yeah. the shapes of things uh, that are different from the way they have evolved into and hardened as even I mean, though they I, were. I, I suppose another way of putting it is is each of those regulatory systems that you are either observing and recording and commenting on, or these these additional this this other kind of. A circle of, of regulatory barriers that represent forms of resistance that you've had to find creative ways to, to manage, to dissipate, uh, to uh, work in, to your advantage. You yeah. know, I mean, it's just... often it's not just about resisting it, it's about that electricity. The logic of the CCTV camera came from the power of its use as. Uh, the, the reason it has those extreme zooms and high resolutions is because it comes from a place where people are being monitored, right? But right. that's not the only possible use of that technology. Right? That's true for everything. Uh, that that the current use of a technology within a current system of governance and capital isn't the only way it can evolve uh, and has. Uh, you know, that's oh, what yeah. is new, right? Yeah, an, uh, and, yeah, an exaggeration would be getting access to a prison or to a, a power plant or to a concentration camp, right? I yeah. mean, in order to seek the truth, you would have to deal with these highly complex and, and almost uh, politicized barriers. That, that's what you the resistance, yeah. yeah. And then you, you, you have to deal with it. It's like far from Vietnam, like uh, this film that, you know, all these people who couldn't go to Vietnam made together, right? Like in the in the in, in the sixties, I mean Jean Luc Godard, for example, right? You try to go there, but maybe you don't uh, succeed, right? right? And then you that effort and that encounter means that you make a film called Far From Vietnam, which is, and you you, you mention Vietnam in every film you make in the next ten years, yeah. for example, right? So so, but these are all locations, like there are sort of spiritual locations uh, in that sense also. Right? That must be it. Let me return to something uh, Shana had mentioned before in the context of uh, speaking about the museum, uh, and I think you may have used the term emancipated. Um, in other words, this was an enlightened audience that uh, should be uh, wise enough uh, to be able to understand uh, everything that's operating in relation to the work, and so they can get access to it, and they can they can interpret it as close as possible to your intended meaning. There, there are those that are outside that, that sphere, uh, which is a good uh, part of the general population. So I'm curious, can you speak to how uh, the contemporary society is influenced and e even manipulated by the capitalist regimes of the movie industry and social media and how you your use of the medium operates in 
in stark contrast as a champion of the truth of the truth. In, in other words, what I it's there's a clear and obvious difference, but if one of your priorities is to uh, meet the general population and yet they they're they're completely immersed into these propaganda techniques, the construction of 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 pleasure and and beauty and entertainment, which which is a, is is about the loss of of critical thinking. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm just, yeah. There's a lot of questions in there. I'm just yeah, yeah. curious how you. You're not against uh, beauty. I mean, you know, even certain kinds of uh, things that maybe, but uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll let China speak. But um, my one sentence would be that one of the things you learn from uh, hanging out with electrical decorators or with, from, you know, people like ship, ship builders and sailors and uh, Indian filmmakers and so on is that, you know, there are different kinds of um, pleasure that that um, mm. exist in excess of the apparently sort of commercial vehicles that they are part of, right? Uh, so there's also excess on the other side, right? So it's not only all on the side of the critical, critical voices, but there are also people that, that push through and you know so there's a sort of complex relationships between uh, all these things that you mentioned and we are certainly not against the idea of um, pleasure right uh, you know anti-pleasure artists but uh, no i mean there's there's a withdrawal right that's at play here and the withdrawal is of course to have headspace and time to think of wanting to enter a CCTV control room or with friends over uh, a lot long nights of coding and digitizing and drinking to conceive of something like Padma in 2008 um, um, or try to digitize in the Afghan film or you know anything that we've done um, this headspace comes from not being on Facebook, uh, uh, disavowing certain kind of internet. And that might come with being micro or, I mean, my analogy is like, like people trying to go off grid, right? Or farmers or uh, uh, saying, I will withdraw from a certain production uh, chain and try and is that the future right now for us we can't cop out right we aren't we recognize our privilege in that circle right to be able to say i can grow avocados in my backyard right so that's not enough for us right so we need to be plugged in we need to live in this built environment we need to confront its uh, uh, inequalities and as you said like fairly macabre scary uh, human condition that we see around us uh, so we're not withdrawing from there but we have to uh, disavow paths, yeah, yeah we have to really choose our paths and that that and i know that's not our a sacrifice for us because that comes organically right it's not like we didn't you know left a bollywood career for this or he left making some you know master mm. you know you, we did withdraw but for 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 um, you know spiritual and intellectual and emotional and artistic reasons um so in that sense yes uh like a gulf to gulf to gulf for two years in the tape modern i have no clue how many people will go then sit on a bench and even see that 83 minute film right there is this kind of uh, ennui and weariness of walking through mega collections or big biennales and exhibitions but it's had a long life these films travel um we have our own yeah, filters travel you pay to acquire the work yeah. you pay to screen it in an institution you can download it for free and they exist at one and the same time right or they're on cell phones they're in the dvd shop in the local like of uh, uh, um, towns in Gujarat, uh, they're online, they're so in a museum. In, in a Pakistani uh, DVD shop. 
Yeah. And so on. So, so you know, they're, they're everywhere. They go off in different directions. And I think that's the thing. I think we've managed to balance that. We've got to earn. We've got to earn from the art world. This is also our daily uh, life. But somehow setting things free has not, we haven't created a scarcity because it doesn't match like the lower public access. It's not based on It's that not based on, you know, budget. even though there might be three editions for no, it's, and And it's, it's really beautiful that everything's open source and, 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 uh, in, in some ways, there there are different uh, lines of of connectivity that are maybe more stealth and invisible, whereby you're able to impact and reach a, a larger global audience. Um, Ashok, you were quoted as saying the intersection of human habitat and technologies being embedded within it. The work deals with the intersection of human habitat and technologies being embedded within it. This may be a quote that is attributed to both of you. I was just curious, you, you have a bachelor's of architecture degree uh, uh, from a, a school in New Delhi. And I'd be curious to hear a little bit about your path uh, as uh, studying architecture. And as we know, in a more conventional standard sense uh, that, that might result yeah. into participating in the production of buildings or, or physical infrastructure as a material state, yet you've chosen uh, with Shauna to uh, privilege immaterial systems that are found within the built environment. I, I'm curious if you, because obviously the audience here are architects, um, maybe uh, your particular path provides some really interesting, important insight. Sure. Um, there's a short version. Uh, there's a one word reason why I'm not an architect, uh, and then there's the longer, longer version. The one word reason is clients, architectural clients. Uh, I used to be an architect, I had an office. I didn't want to deal with clients. Uh, you know, being a, a very specific form of business that you transact. And this is true probably for graphic designers and many other kinds of people who are part of the industry. Of, uh, creative industry type of format. Uh, it was particularly useful in my case that uh, I uh, completed a five-year professional, you know, what's called a professional architecture degree. I had a license to practice, um, uh, but I left the big city and I tried to start my own. I was always rookie looking for a kind of a, uh, let's say, a, a sort of don't want to use the word ontology too much, but basically, like, what's this about, right? I mean, you, what do you want? To, like, the fundamental sort of core question, which is, which somehow preoccupies uh, camp as well to some extent. There's a, there's a the basic truth condition of a situation must be addressed, and I didn't find architects trying doing that in interesting enough ways at the time. There were lots of different kinds of shadows on the architectural profession. It was also in the beginning of the neoliberal period. Um, uh, uh, and then so I went away into a very different kind of environment in the Himalayas where I had grown up in order to try and have an architectural practice there. Um, and after a year or two of doing that uh, very intensively and seriously in a way, uh, the problem that I had was that you were always working for someone who did not share the values that you did. So in a way, what you had to produce was a form of art that would convince them of your worldview, right? Which wasn't interesting on the terms that were set out in the architectural profession. So, uh, because, you know, I had to build something for them, uh, you know, to, 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 to use in a certain way, and not only them, but their, their mm -hmm. friends and their friends. So anyway, uh, the, the, yeah, the one word version was that. And then the other version was that I had uh, then an alternative career in, um, in working very closely actually on a couple of large international exhibitions involving. Uh, so when I left uh, the Himalayan situation, uh, came back to Delhi and worked on exhibitions involving uh, a large number of artists and craftspeople on a project called Basic Needs uh, Pavilion in Hanover, which was a, which was a kind of a leftover of the Great World Fair sort of thing, but also maybe proto you know, 
Venice or something else. Like it was a, it was a kind of a combination, but uh, it was a form of exhibition making. Uh, that I and then I made sort of uh, something clicked in my head in terms of and this was still when I was in my early twenties. So at around twenty five, I made a decision to be an artist, and right. that's when then a lot of other things happened. And then I trained in a in a sort of new media environment and and so on. So, but then also came back to India in 2005 to do all this stuff. No, no, I appreciate that. And, and I, I, I want to say that I have a, a pretty open and expansive uh, understanding of the education of an architect as really just a foundation of thought. And it's intrinsically interdisciplinary, as is your practice. And, and, and as the, the, the dean of the school, um, I simply have the students, I raise awareness about the fact that they design their future. Sometimes uh, it, it's a straight line and sometimes uh, it's uh, improvisational in the sense you- No, absolutely. It, it turns into something you couldn't possibly imagine. And I think that you're actually having both of you uh, uh, conceptually, an enormous impact uh, on every city. I mean, there's something profoundly ambitious and 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 uh, beautifully expansive in in terms of the all of your case study projects. In a sense, uh, can be applied to places all over the world. So, although it may literally situate itself in Bombay or Mumbai or or uh, you know uh, Palestine. Uh, the fact is, the lessons and and knowledge that is is acquired has a kind of universal breadth to it. So um, you're you're probably having uh, an infinite more influence over the world that you live in, based on what was important uh, for you as a, as a creative and intellectual uh, person. Um, Listen, I, it's, it's 2.20, you, you've been incredibly uh, generous. I know it's getting late there. And, and oh, you're, nice. you've put your son to bed and you probably wanna see how he's doing. Um, I, I do wanna thank you. I, I thought it was uh, incredibly poignant and authentic and genuine and really unique. I mean, your, your, your practice uh, in my mind represents a kind of paradigm shift uh, in the world for the next generation of, of graduates coming out of higher education around the world. And, and it's, it's in these in-between spaces where you've, you've found such a, uh, an extraordinary uh, amount of, of thought and poetic imagination and uh, insight on the world we live in. So you're kind of storytellers, contemporary storytellers. I don't, I would leave the last uh, words for the two of you, uh, because although uh, there's fewer students uh, participating right at this moment in real time because they're in classes, they will, as I mentioned earlier, uh, turn on uh, this video tonight, uh, tomorrow night, and throughout the rest of the semester. So uh, might there be any uh, parting words uh, that you could share with, with our student body? Um, feel free to email us because we feel a bit odd not seeing faces um, or having a more uh, embodied Q&A. Um, yeah, thank you, even because I think the one thing we don't emphasize, but is still a kernel, is the sort of epistemological or uh, pedagogical impulse in our work, right? That's where the, in, to be parasited on again and to be, I mean, somebody should use us to do something. Yeah. I mean, or well, not us, literally, but what things we did should have. Uh, we are part of a relay, and when we've changed the tracks a little bit, you know, as much as we could. So it's always nice to see if somebody does something. Yeah, really? Thank uh, or you. Or if somebody has any responses that, you know, uh, sure. that reflect back on us. And, and your responses have been, to, to be honest, um, very generous and uh, surprisingly um, uh, 
generous and 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 uh, so so i mean i'm just uh, we're warmed by your, yeah they really they really resonated your, with by your thoughts uh, why we're here why we and, do what um, we do and uh, it yes. make somehow all this re- <laughs> yeah. weird internet kind of connection sort of worth it that somehow you you can sort of synchronize still across brains across you know, yeah no we things. get the humanity in your work and uh, i we applaud you uh, if we were uh, in person uh, inside our theater, we have a, and I'll invite you back after COVID and del- and the Delta disappear. We have a beautiful 360 degree uh, panoramic, well, we have a panoramic screen, but w- which you guys would absolutely love. In fact, you should apply for an artist in residency here. Uh, mm. uh, Lori Anderson was the first artist to come to RPI and mm. the technology in this particular building I'm talking about, which is called Impact, would be something I think you would find enormous uh, inspiration with. But we also have a, uh, a 60 foot IMAX screen too, similar maybe to the one that you showed earlier. And, and there's nothing like uh, enlarging your work to the size of buildings and cities where just it has a, a, a kind of otherness. So I hope we can keep in touch. I wish you uh, much, uh, all the best for your work, but also safety and good health. And uh, thank you for spending the time this evening with us. We appreciate it. Likewise, thank Likewise. you. Even. Thank you. And uh, mm. shout That's out fine. to Anish. I think there's a, someone from Bombay <laughs> sitting out there. Yes, and, and yes. Anish is great. He's wonderful. He sent a, write, a nice note to you. Yes. And I do urge all the students to contact uh, the two of you, uh, so that they can enter into a, a private uh, discussion that might be incredibly enlightening. Have a wonderful night and speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care. Thank Take you. Take care, everyone. Thank Bye-bye. you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.